Good. All right. This talk is non-technical. I've been struggling all day long to try and uh, keep up with the talks that have come before. I know I'm standing between you and beer, and I know I'm talking about something that, well, at least for me, is super, super annoying. I tried to find a picture of an MVP, but I just saw a better picture of an MVP earlier today. <laughs> and I want to be current, and after just having a, heard a talk on keeping data current and linked, I thought I'd do the same thing. Uh, look, uh, are, who has heard of this term, minimum viable product before, MVP? Okay, let me ask you a question. On a scale of one to five, how useful is this term for you where five is, I love this term, saves my life, uh, it's great. Three is it's okay, and one is life sucks because of it. On a scale of one to five, how useful is this term for you? Give me a show of uh, numbers. Uh, you should look around and it, it always, varies a lot. Now, um, yeah, before we get started, uh, what does this term mean? Can somebody give me a shout out? What, what is it, what, in your organization, what is the definition of MVP? Make money fast. Yeah, so um, make money fast. Um, what else? Say, uh, say the thing there. What did I hear? Shit software. Shit software. Okay, and then I heard something. Uh, 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 something over there. Do the minimum. Uh, kitchen sink. Ah, uh, that sounds. Yeah, the. Uh, smallest thing uh, that can result in uh, happy customers happy or happy management. What did I hear? <laughs> I'm off screen. What else did I hear? Take a credit card payment. Uh, 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 take a credit card payment. Uh, <laughs> smallest thing that will allow you to take a credit card payment. <laughs> uh, Anything else useful? Let's go back to the drawing board. Uh, back to the drawing board. Uh, is that what MVP means, or do we need to? Uh. All right. Look, it's a term we use, and it means a lot of different things. And I want to see if I can explain why. Uh, I need to go back. It's, it seems like everybody's telling stories about what they did when they were old or young or what they did a long time ago. In 1985, I sold software for a living. It took me a while to become a software developer, and I worked in a software store, uh, something like that. That's not me. It looks a lot <laughs> like I used to look, though. For those old enough to remember what software looked like in 1985, and I know Dave does, we used to sell it in something called a box. <laughs> And there were a bunch of boxes on the shelf. And, and there were a whole bunch. And that's actually one of the boxes I sold a lot of. Uh, because personal computers were just becoming super common. And this was a piece of educational software. So look, this is the kind of box that I sold. Now, I need to talk about 1985 because I need to talk about where this term MVP came from because it's sort of old. It's been around for a little while. So let me explain the way the software business works to you guys, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> it, it, it starts with, with, with ideas. And, and it could be an idea for a whole new product or for a feature. But we've got to take these ideas and turn them into a, a box. And there's a lot of, well, we don't know what's in this product or how many features or capabilities it's got. Uh, we're going to spend money to, to build this thing. It's going to cost us something. It's going to take uh, some time to build this thing. And what we've got to really arm wrestle about is this scope stuff, how much of these features and capabilities do we need to put in this thing uh, so that we can get this thing done or built. 
because what matters uh, after this thing gets built is that people see this thing, uh, well, they'll see that box on the shelf and they'll try it or, uh, well, they may have to buy it before they try it and then they'll use this thing and ideally they'll keep using it and uh, ideally they will say good things about it. And by that I mean tell other people and uh, write good reviews and things like that. And enough people, not just one, but lots and lots of people have to do all those things before we start to make money. Because what matters is that our organization makes some money, that we get ROI. Is that my computer? Uh, uh, look, we need return on investment. We need to worry about our brand. We need to worry about our market share. And that's the way this works. Now, uh, for people that have seen me talk before, and this is really interesting, my WhatsApp is up. <laughs> so I'm gonna have a conversation here for a minute, so don't mind me. Uh, uh, Look, I draw this all the time. For anybody who's ever seen me give a class or something like that, I draw this all the time because people get all hosed up all the time about the difference between all those things. Anybody who works in a software company knows time, cost, and scope, that's the crap that we worry about. But what's interesting is none of that actually matters. All that stuff between the idea and when we ship it, uh, that's just the output. That's ju just what we make. What matters is all this crap that happens after things come out. Now, I want people to understand that that is called outcome because it's what happens after things come out. And if we measure output in time, cost, and scope, we measure outcome in all this junk, and none of it is time, cost, and scope. All this stuff is people's behavior. And if you thought predicting time, cost, and scope was hard, predicting people's behavior is even harder. And if these people don't do this stuff, we don't get this stuff. And uh, well, I'll refer to this stuff as impact because that's the impactful stuff or this is the stuff that lags behind this behavior stuff. Now, in, in the 1980s and the 1990s, it was super hard. We had to make good choices in here because we had to get this stuff built, get this stuff shipped. We had to print a bunch of boxes. We had to print a bunch of floppy disks back then and later CDs and DVDs and print all those boxes. And if we got this wrong and people saw, try, hated, stopped using, said bad things, we wouldn't make any money and we'd go out of business. And I worked for a software company back in the 1990s and that's sort of how it worked. Even when we made software that was big and went into companies, we still sort of put it in a box or at least we pretended there was a box, but we would still go out on site and install it in their company. And it sort of had to be right uh, out of the chute. Now, let me introduce you to this particular guy. Uh, his name is Frank Robinson. He built software in the 1980s and the 1990s. And ironically, that's one of the pieces of software, one of the companies he worked with, and that's one of the boxes he was responsible for building. So he came up with this, he was trying to describe the work that you need to do to figure out how much stuff goes into that product. Uh, Frank said, look, if you put too much stuff in this product, that might not be good, or at minimum, if you put a lot of stuff in this product, it's gonna take a long time to build it. Uh, if you put too little in this product, people will see it, try it, and hate it, and that's gonna work out. So what we're trying to do is come up with the very least we could put into this product, but still be wildly successful. Now, Frank, like a lot of consultants, came up with a lot of clever ways to do research and figure all this stuff out, and he kind of kept a lot of them close, but one of the cool things Frank did was define this term, minimum viable product. And he was pretty clear about it. Uh, the minimum viable product was th the smallest uh, product or release that could meet its desired outcomes. Doesn't have an apostrophe, yes, don't do that. Um, now, uh, look, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, Frank used this MVP term uh, when he said product, uh, what he meant was product. And when he said viable, uh, what he meant was, well, successful. 
Um, uh, he meant that it could meet its desired outcomes. And specifically, he said, we're going to maximize ROI with this thing. That's what viable meant. Now, let's fast forward a little bit, since I'm giving a bit of a history lesson. And let's talk about uh, uh, this guy. This guy's name is Eric Ries. Uh, he built software, but his software didn't have a box. Uh, he built software uh, around, well, 2009, 2010, 2011. And he was building software on that interweb thing. Uh, we can't call it cyberspace anymore because of William Gibson and uh, what, what he just said. Anyway, but uh, uh, look, it is, uh, he was building software that was in cyberspace. It didn't have a box anymore. And he was a startup. In fact, when he released his stuff on the web, he didn't need to get it right the first time. Uh, it's not like it would hurt the brand of his business. Oh, by the way, that's the company that Eric Reese worked for, IMVU. How many people have heard of IMVU? How many people use IMVU? That's what I thought. There were, I think there was one. Um, uh, this wasn't a wildly successful product. Uh, and so anything they did wrong wasn't going to hurt their brand very much. Uh, and they did an awful lot of things wrong. Uh, and, and it took a while. And they did enough things wrong uh, that Eric, uh, well, Eric was a, an agile person. He used extreme programming specifically. And he thought that agile was going to save their company. And it turns out that. The Agile helped him deliver a lot of crap fast. But uh, <laughs> what he learned is the faster you deliver crap, the more crap you get. And, <laughs> and that wasn't the point. And uh, he said, this is really frustrating because we delivered a product that was an MVP, and we should be making money. And he, he had made a mistake. Well, on his board of directors uh, was this guy named Steve Blank. Uh, now, I heard him mention, Heidi mentioned him a little bit earlier today, and, and, and he was an advisor. And what Eric, what, what Steve said is, look, you're not doing this validated learning thing. What Eric fell into the trap of was thinking that this MVP thing, the way you figure out what an MVP was, uh, well, he, he thought that the, the point was to, to guess. Now, it was Robinson um, who uh, came up with that definition. And that was in 2001. Uh, and it was in 2011 that Reese came along. Now, let me, uh, let me tell you how this validated learning thing works. Uh, let's explain this. Some of you already know this stuff. Just hum along with me. It's, if you've got an idea for a product, the first thing you don't do is build it. Uh, the first <laughs> thing you do uh, is to say, what could possibly go wrong with this idea? Uh, we call this, a, well, some black hat thinking. Uh, we put on our black hats. Uh, we think evil things about our product. And we build a list. That list could be a, contain a bunch of risks. It could contain a bunch of questions. It could contain a bunch of just assumptions we're making that could be just dead wrong. And if we've got this backlog, a backlog of things to not, not build, a backlog of things that could go wrong with our idea, and we'll take that scariest thing off the top, and we'll ask, what if this is the thing that scares us the most? Uh, What's the least I could do to, to learn something that would make me not be so scared? Uh, if we turn that into a question, then we can come up with some ideas uh, to, to test it. N now, uh, once we figured out how to test it, we can uh, uh, do a little bit of work uh, to create a test. Uh, and uh, then we can put that test in front of some people. Oftentimes, that test could, is a prototype. Oftentimes, it's a little bit of software. Oftentimes, it's the, that silly controller that Simon just built, stuff like that. And we, we build it. We see if it works, if it solves problems, if, it, uh, if people really want it, we'll use it. We'll get back some data. And we use that to change our idea. We use that to change our, our idea of what risks are. Now, 
Eric Ries, we owe him a huge debt of gratitude. But look, look, I just showed you this picture of Simon, of, excuse me, of Steve Blank. And Steve Blank wrote this book called Four Steps to Epiphany. Has anybody ever read that book before? Was that, but, so for the couple people that have, was that an easy read? No, that book sort of sucked. Um, it was <laughs> super hard to read. And, uh, and look at when Steve tells Eric, uh, look, you need to do this, uh, this validated learning stuff. Uh, Eric says, your, your book is super hard to read. And, and he comes up with a simpler explanation uh, for it. Now, uh, that's what we owe Eric Reese a huge debt of gratitude for. But Eric Reese um, sucks at naming things. Eric Reese uh, referred to his process as a lean startup. Now, if you know anything about lean process, there's a lot to lean process. So there's a lot to lean thinking, not just the little bit of, uh, well, one of the things he latched onto was reducing the cycle time of getting around this, going faster there. But there's a lot more to lean thinking than just reducing cycle time. So lean startup is not very lean. And Eric just happened to work for a startup, but this validated learning thing, it's not a startup thing, it's just a thing. So lean startup is not very lean and is not for startups. Now, Eric referred to this cycle as uh, a build, uh, measure, and learn cycle, where build actually means figure out what your biggest risk is and figure out a way to test it. And what you build is a test, and that could be a paper prototype, or it could be a bunch of different things, which is what we got to talk about. So build actually doesn't mean build. Uh, and measure sounds like it's, you're going to get data back from that, but measure oftentimes is observe and oftentimes is very subjective. So measure may not mean measure the way you think it does. But at least learn means learn. <laughs> and so, he, so that works. That much works. Now, what Eric then went on to add more insult to injury, he said this MVP, this way of this MVP concept is screwed up because it's just guessing. Well, that's not what Robinson thought. What Robinson thought is, Eric, this is what you do. Uh, but Eric didn't know that. Uh, so, so Eric said, I'm going to redefine this whole MVP concept, and we're going to call it the, well, the smallest thing you could do uh, or make uh, to test your hypothesis. By the way, hypothesis is the new word for guess. Uh, so this is the smallest thing you could do to test your hypothesis. Now, what's interesting is it's not just overloading. It's these two definitions aren't subtly different. They are polar opposites. When Eric said product, what he meant was test. And when he said viable, what he meant is that you learn something. So when you tell your organization, I'm going to ship an MVP, someone may actually think, may think you mean viable product, because it's what you said. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but you've read the Lean Startup, and you're enlightened, and you read, uh, uh, came up with a term from somebody who's really bad at naming things, and, and you wave it around, and, and you think you mean test. Um, now, uh, some people are not so sure what it means. And if you use this agile development stuff, where the goal is potentially shippable software, and we're trying to ship more software faster, we come up with a weird third definition, which is, uh, well, lots of variations of the crappy first release, or uh, as much as we could build in time. Now, so. This is where we are. And I'm going to tell you, if, if I have one goal, it's that you maybe stop using this word. Uh, these are important concepts. It is important. Your company, remember, where's my picture? Look, if people don't see, try, use, and keep using your software, and you don't make money, uh, the alternative to this flow is going out of business. And, uh, that's not good. You need to make money. You need a viable product. So that definition was super important to get to. But the only way to get to a viable product is, well, there's actually two good ways to get to it. You can guess, or you can, well, do this, uh, this other thing. Uh, so I'm going to re 
cast these two things. I'm going to refer to this thing as, well, let's call it the smallest successful release. And let's call this other thing here our next best test. Because remember, it's a cycle. We go through this and go around this cycle an awful lot. So that's sort of what I want to talk about. Uh, let's talk about uh, this stuff we do, this stuff we build, this stuff we make uh, to learn, because that's the, the goal of this stuff. And well, let's draw one more picture. I need to actually show some pictures I didn't draw, because mine are sort of messy. Look, there's a bunch of things we can do, and those range from really fast and cheap and all the way to really expensive and time consuming. Now, I'm going to tell you that if you have a, a guess or a hypothesis about a, a product or an idea, the most expensive, time consuming thing you can do to see if you're right is to build scalable, shippable software. Now, uh, if you're wrong, uh, well, there's a lot of cheap things you can do. Uh, look, if we think of just kind of the questions you uh, got, uh, do we really understand the, the problem uh, we're solving? Uh, do we know what problems uh, people have? Uh, uh, can we build a, a solution? Uh, do we understand enough about the technology? Uh, do, do people want it? Uh, 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 will they keep using it? Uh, because if we don't understand the problem, if we can't build it, if they don't want it, and if they don't keep using it, uh, then none of this matters. Let's start from there. Um, actually, I've been using this word hypothesis or guess, uh, but I want to talk about these things as bets. I want to start to show some actual examples of some real uh, well, some real companies doing this stuff. There's a company I've been working with for a long time in the United States. They're called CarMax. CarMax is officially the planet's large, largest used car dealership. Now, used car dealership isn't normally a cool thing. Uh, they are a Fortune 100 company. Uh, look, I'm looking at the slide and I realize the numbers are already a little out of date. Uh, they're a couple years old. Uh, their sales were 14 billion when I did this. They're closer to 16 billion now. Uh, their, their locations are about 180. And while we've been talking here, they've already sold several cars. Uh, they're fairly big. Uh, this is a team of people at CarMax working. And I often show people this picture because I want people to see all this stuff on the wall behind them. All these, uh, there's a lot of data in there. On, there's data on the wall about experiments they're running. There's a lot of uh, information they've collected subjectively. And every time I show people this, this picture, people say, why do they have such crappy expressions on their faces? So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the, Archie is a design person. Beth is a product manager. I'm standing next to the, the engineers, and I took the picture. The people in that picture are executives. Shamim is the CIO. If you were to Google CarMax and Forbes magazine and the CIO, you'll see there's articles on him about the kinds of things that they're doing with this producty stuff. What's important is behind them are these things called hypothesis statements. Hypothesis statements, you know, they're not, uh, are people familiar with agile development, those user story things? How many people have to use those things or have them foist on them? Uh, they're, they're these, as a user, I want so that. These hypothesis statements, these are about what we believe about our product. The team you were looking at is a finance team. They make, uh, well, the part of the product that does fi financing to allow people to buy cars. And they've got a hypothesis there that says they believe that they, if they can provide people that, people like Maureen, uh, she's an example of a person who needs financing in order to buy a car, but she's the type of person who needs financing and she considers a monthly car payment uh, an expense like rent or, or something else and she shops based upon the car payment. The only annoying 
annoying thing is all those cars out on the lots don't have the car payment on them. They have the price of the car on them. And the car payment is a function of what the bank will lend and what rates are today and how good her credit is. And, and it makes it hard for her to buy a car. And when she chooses, she sometimes finds out, what the, often finds out what the payment is and uh, has to, uh, she only finds out what the payment is and when she sits down and does the paperwork. But they believe if they can give her decisions or basically tell her on every single car she's looking at, you're absolutely approved, this is exactly what your payment is, and all you have to do is say, yes, I want that one. If you're shopping online, you can click buy it, and they do home delivery. Uh, they believe, if they can make it uh, super easy for her to do this, that she will, well, that she will feel more empowered, uh, that she'll save time buying a car, but the most important thing for CarMax is they're gonna have a higher conversion rate. They're gonna make more money. This is a hypothesis statement. There's a couple of those behind them, and this is the way this company works. At least by calling it a hypothesis, at least they're acknowledging we may not be right. And now they've got something to think about or something to test. I like, every time I show a hypothesis statement, there is someone with a science background in the room that says that's not the way you really write them, and uh, uh, there's, it's, there's more to testing hypotheses than uh, what you do in software development. So that's why I like calling these things bets. I'm going to call them bets until a gambler tells me I'm using that wrong. <laughs> now, if, if we start to lump things together, uh, look, if, if, we, if we, if we, we need to ask, do we really understand the, the problems that, that we're solving? And oftentimes, the simplest way to know if you understand isn't, isn't to just start building stuff, it's to actually find and meet people that are using products that you make or using products like the ones you make. This is a team, the, the tall guy on the right works for Kodak, and yes, they're still in business. Uh, but one of the products they have that actually works and does pretty well is a kiosk that goes in grocery stores and pharmacies. You bring in your camera or a USB stick, plug it in, and you print out a high-resolution picture. They're, uh, they're in a CVS store in the United States. Guy on the left is a UX person. Guy standing behind the guy on the right is an, an, one of the engineers on the team. The short, white-haired person is not on their team. She's been trying to get a picture out for the last for the last half hour. They've been watching her and they stop and talk to her and see how it goes. Uh, they do this once a week and they really understand what it's like to, to use their product, or at least they do now. The, the day I was there, at the end of the day, this guy uh, came back. We were kind of sharing what came out and, and he shared, this has been the worst day of my life. He said, I had no idea how much damage we were inflicting on people. When you watch people actually use a product that you've made, I promise you, you won't prioritize your backlog the same way again. Uh, I spend a lot of time working with people, helping them understand uh, what they're building, helping them understand their users. Guy on the right is a product manager for a line of portable printers. Guy on the left is from China. He designs portable printers. The guy in the middle will take pictures of you and your family in front of the Gateway Monument in Mumbai for 30 rupees. That's his portable printer. They spend time with people who actually use their product and they start to really understand what the problems are. Uh, that printer design isn't an academic exercise. They, uh, they, they start to care about what they're building. Look, uh, this guy uh, works at a bank and sometimes the best way to learn how he does things is ask him to show us how he, how he does his job. That's referred to as an apprenticeship style interview and that's what we're doing is having him teach us his job and along the way we realize how tough the, the stuff we built for him is to use. Uh, oh shoot. Uh, well, this guy is a, is a stock trader, uh, excuse me, not a trader, a portfolio manager. He works at Barclays. Barclays got mentioned this morning. Uh, in working with this organization, we were responsible for building this portfolio management software, and we, we said, look, we don't know what it's like to be one of these users. We've got a big backlog of a bunch of stuff to build here. It would be helpful for us if we could talk to those people. Uh, they said, no, you definitely can't talk to those people because they're traders, they're the ones uh, driving our organization, they're the ones uh, that make all the money, and they're way too busy to talk to you. And I said, well, uh, we don't want to uh, get in their way, but it's going to be really tough if we don't know what their job is like. Uh, and they said, okay, well, we'll work on trying to arrange a meeting uh, for you. 
uh, check back with us next week. And we said, well, don't they just work down on the third floor? And they said, yeah, but you can't bug them. And I said, well, well could we just go down there and take a couple pictures so we know what it's like uh, to work there? And they said, definitely you can't. L legal would be all over you. Uh, you definitely can't take pictures. So don't go down there. Wait for us. We'll get back with you next week. We went down to the third floor, uh, and as it turns out, our badges wouldn't get us onto the trading floor, but there was glass there, so we could just look through and take pictures, and somebody came up behind us and said, are you guys trying to get in here? And we said, yeah. And they said, okay, and they buzzed us through. Um, and we, we stood back and uh, watched, and uh, 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 the portfolio manager, this, this guy, turned and asked us, what are you guys doing here? And we said, well, we're responsible for the portfolio management system, but we don't want to bug you. We know you're super busy, and we just want to see how you guys work. He said, have a seat. Let me show you this. Uh, and we spend the afternoon there working with them. And, and he says, this is fantastic. Nobody ever comes down to talk to us. <laughs> spend time talking to people. I don't want to over rant about this stuff. Uh, these guys are portfolio managers. and. Uh, but they work with an active equity fund and they work together in teams and it's very different than guys like that who work on fixed equity fund and funds and those differences that make a difference uh, are, are what you need to pay attention to. The system that works for that guy isn't the same system that works for those guys. One of the most important things to pay attention to in this picture is, let me pan to the right, is this window, because it's 4 freaking a.m. in San Francisco where we are, and that's how early I have to get up to watch these guys work, because they've got to do an awful lot of work uh, ahead of the, the trading day. And the morning we were there, the, the engine that the quants used to figure out stuff was broken, and we sat with them for a couple hours while they tried to figure out what was going wrong with the engine. Nothing is cooler than watching people struggle with a piece of crappy software you wrote. Uh, that helps you uh, feel the need to fix it. I like quoting this friend of mine from this Australian company called Atlassian. Uh, look, that, that as a rule, they don't do customer interviews. They don't talk with customers without having developers in the room. It's sort of important that everybody understands how this feels. It's sort of important that everybody understands the problems we're solving. Now, look, that, if, if your biggest concern is we're actually solving the right problem, there's a lot of cheaper ways to, to do that than, uh, look, if I look at my continuum here, uh, you can interview people, you can uh, observe people. Uh, if you really hate talking to people, you can do things like surveys or other things, but all those are a lot cheaper than building software. Now, look, if you've got to start to figure out if people really want your stuff. Uh, one way, again, the expensive ways to build it and see if they will buy it. Um, but there's, well, cheaper ways. Let's see if this audio works. This guy is the founder of TripAdvisor, and he talks about one of the, the cheapest ways to test if somebody wants something. Is there, what, what are maybe some of the, if you have it, like some of the top thing, piece of advice you might give? Uh, I, the I, things you've learned or? Yeah. I, I, uh, I've, I've learned, uh, for at least in uh, uh, a web-based, a consumer-facing web-based business, there's nothing like running a little test on the website itself to say, what do customers, what do your visitors really want? And the notion of doing a quick test solves umpteen meetings worth of powerful debate and logical arguments. So at, at, at TripAdvisor, we've, uh, for quite some time, done and these things called 404 tests and HTTP 404 error. It's a link. It's broken. It gives mm -hmm. you an error. And uh, you know, I'm a fan of. Look, you want to test whether consumers want to sign up for uh, a weekly newsletter on ski vacations. Hey, go put a link before you build the darn thing. Go put a link on your ski pages uh, that says sign up for our ski newsletter. So it's a 404 test because you literally just redirect your 404s to this? No, you, oh. you put the link, you, you market okay. it any which way you want on the okay. site, the most compelling call to action, sign up, great ski newsletter. But before you actually spend the energy to design and build the product that you're actually going to deliver, in this case a newsletter, you put it on the site for an hour or a day and you see how many people click it. It goes nowhere. It says broken link to the user. I see, I see. Your log file says how many people clicked on it. Yeah. And you know the 
the, the marketing pushback I got when it was first introduced was, how can you do that to your customers? You're putting a broken link on your site deliberately. And I'm like, look, almost all the visitors' site, when they, accompany, when they find a broken link, they're going to blame their internet connection, not me. <laughs> and what's the worst that can happen? A thousand people or five thousand people can hit that broken link, and you're pissed off as a marketeer because we've disappointed a thousand people. I'm high-fiving it all over the place because with a ten-minute test, I found some great usability, some great user feedback that says they want this feature. Or yeah, and you maybe avoided disappointing far more people, right? Obviously in the other yeah. direction, if nobody actually clicked on it, then all yeah. the debate about whether it's a great idea or not is out the window. We couldn't market it on our own site. Yeah, if yeah. we can't do that, I'm not interested as a feature. So, look, uh, a 404 test, uh, that helps to see if people really want it. Uh, it, these are sometimes called uh, fake door tests or buttons to nowhere that Eric Reese guy would talk about landing page tests to, to pitch a product, but there's no product behind it, but that's how we test to see if people want it. Uh, uh, we're a lot better with those. We don't actually generate a 404 error now. People will uh, bring up a page and, and let people know the feature's not yet implemented, even give you an opportunity to be notified when it is uh, going to be implemented. Uh, uh, and look, look, when guys like Dave Farley uh, this morning say that Amazon has released 20 times while you have exhaled this morning, b be aware that a lot of the, what Amazon is releasing over and over, a lot of what comes out are tests like this. Uh, they're doing an awful lot to test whether you want things. Uh, very limited small releases to small areas uh, to, to, well, do things like a, an A-B test uh, to test one thing against another or uh, to put an experience out there and see what happens with it and really control those, uh, dip uh, something in. It's a lot of things we can do and it takes some smart engineering to do it. I want to go back to those, uh, those uh, CarMax people. Uh, they had this idea that if they showed people, they let people shop for cars, uh, and after filling out a very short application, say, look, you're approved, and now you can shop by payment, and they would show you cars with payments. Uh, one of the things they did was present, well, uh, they uh, did the, the simplest thing they could do. They kept doing those uh, interview things, uh, plus a, a, a prototype. The purpose of the prototype wasn't to test if they could use it, it was to test to see if they wanted it. Did they get excited about it? They put simple prototypes in front of people. By the way, when you're thinking of prototypes, prototypes have a, a three axes to think about for fidelity. You've got the, the way it looks, uh, the, the, the visual design thing, and the prototype I just showed you from CarMax looked pretty good, it looked right. But you've also got the, the data. Is that data really accurate? And uh, finally, you've got the, the functionality. Uh, does it, uh, is it functionally correct? Sometimes you can spool up, make it, make, if it looks like crap, but it works right, that's one element. If it looks awesome, but it has stupid data in it, that's not good or might be enough. When CarMax put this thing in front of people, it looked awesome and the data was pretty accurate, but they, what they started to see is that people just aren't engaging with the prototype because it isn't functional and not everybody wanted that 2010 Volkswagen Jetta. Uh, the, the data was, while well, accurate for a 2010 Jetta, didn't match the car that they were looking for. And, well, let's... Uh, they needed a higher fidelity prototype. It needed to be functional. It needed data behind it. And this is where things got messy. To get data behind this thing was going to mean we are actually going to have to calculate payments for every car that we've got, and they've got to be somewhat accurate, and there's some, there's a, there's, this is going to be tough. Let me, uh, there's a continuum here. Sometimes we uh, build a prototype. Sometimes we move to a prototype that is a, a functional uh, prototype. I mean, it has a code behind it. Uh, we sometimes call that a live data prototype. And that starts to edge towards more expensive. Let me, I think you've all been in situations where you've worked at a company where someone is going to go off and build a spike or a prototype or a proof of concept and three months go by and they're still building a proof of concept. And that's what this started to smell like. Uh, and it was starting to scare people. 
There's another axis to this drawing that I'm drawing here, um, uh, uh, where we look at how much we're spending, but we step back and take a look at, well, we take a look at how much uh, evidence we've got. We'd be higher on that axis if we had a lot of evidence. We take a look at, well, how much risk we have. If, if, if the risk is really low uh, for releasing something, let's go ahead and release something. But if there's high risk, if we'd hurt our brand, if we did something bad, then uh, we'll watch out for that. We also look at our, our confidence. If we're pretty uh, confident uh, that, that we're right, uh, we'd be higher on this chart. Now, um, actually, a friend of mine at Adobe, confidence is tough because Everybody's super confident until they fail. And uh, this is, uh, a, my friend at Adobe uses this scale and we dust off the betting word and he would say, well, what would you, if we've got this hypothesis, you believe people will uh, try it, use it, love it, and, and will make money on it. How confident are you? Would you bet me lunch uh, that you're right? Or would you bet me uh, a day's pay that you're right? Or would you bet me your car uh, that you're right? Would you bet me your house uh, that you're right? Or would you bet me your job uh, that you're right? Now, the way you use this chart is by looking at what you're doing. If, look, we're about to build scalable, shippable software, we communicate the hypothesis, and then we talk about it, and, and we say, look, what, what would you bet that you're li right? Would you bet me lunch? And everybody says, yeah, we bet you lunch. And we, we say, would you bet me a day's pay? We'd say, ah, I'm a little shaky on that. And that would put you right here in this chart. Uh, uh, less than a day's pay you'd bet, and we're building production software. This is the stupid zone. <laughs> Stupid and expensive. Uh, now, we used to call this analysis paralysis, but these days a lot of people are doing this uh, discovery work or this MVP stuff. They do these interviews, they create prototypes, but sometimes I see people doing this stuff on painfully obvious errors where the risk is really low if we just apply a solution that everybody understands. A lot of times I would bet you my house that this is going to fix things, but we are thrashing here. That uh, would put you here in this chart. This is also stupid, uh, but it's just wasting time. When you look at this chart, you can see there's sort of a safe zone. Uh, the, the safe zone is uh, well, sort of a stripe right up the center, where I increase what I spend on these tests uh, as my confidence or my evidence increases. At CarMax, we were running into this situation where, it looked for us uh, to get to higher fidelity was going to involve spending a lot of money and time, and it was pulling us down into the stupid zone. And it caused the uh, engineers to say, okay, look, how do we spend a lot less to test this thing? And we looked at data and functionality, and we found that finance had created a really uh, awesome spreadsheet that was huge that actually had a lot of data, but we couldn't connect it to the A-B test framework because it was a, an Excel spreadsheet. It couldn't have very many concurrent people using it. In fact, one or two would uh, be... <laughs> that basically wouldn't support lots of people using it concurrently. So we figured, OK, we could use the A-B testing framework, but we got to make sure that only one person is using it at a time. Uh, and, and well, they figured out a way to hack this together. I wanted to show you what testing looks like, or this is what an MVP test looks like, because I happened to be there the day they were doing this. And this is how interviewing or testing looks when you're trying to see if people want your product. Uh, they are using a product called Ethneo. Uh, I showed you those people from Kodak who go out to Kodak stores and watch people use it. Ethneo uh, will watch people using your website and pop up a screener and say, uh, notice that you're shopping, and then you can construct the screener. In this case, they said, are you looking at buying a car in the next, in the next month, and will you be financing the car? And the most important question, would you be willing to talk to us right now? And they call it ethneo fishing because they put that screener up, let it sit for just a minute, and then catch people or uh, hook them and then give them a call. Let's see how good my sound is on this one. Hello, this is Matt. Hey, Matt, uh, this is uh, Archie Miller from, uh, calling from CarMax. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. Hey, listen, Matt, you had recently filled out a uh, survey on our website saying that you might be able to help us with some research. Is that, yeah. is that still the case? Yeah, sure. Could you just hold on like 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Take your okay. time. 
anytime at rockoscollision.com. This guy's at work. Uh, he shouldn't be looking for cars while he's on the job. He has to put them on hold. Look, if they had tried to actually schedule to go out, uh, schedule to have this guy come out and talk to them, uh, that might have been tough. But that's the cool thing about this. They catch him at work. He puts them on hold and comes back. I want to show just a little yeah, bit. So, of man, if you don't mind, I'd like to do a quick role playing exercise with you. Wait, let me go back. Yet, uh, that one. Oh, well, maybe I don't have it. So, man, if you don't mind, I'd like to do a quick role-playing exercise with you, if I could. Okay. Uh, so, um, you had indicated in the screener that you filled out that you might consider financing for this car? Yes. Um, so, what would your financing situation look like in terms Now, I... I, I'm shortening this a lot. Uh, look, they got him online. They started sharing screens. Uh, they had him look for the car that he was looking at. It turns out he's looking for a Mercedes ML. Uh, they scan through cars. He tells them why he loves this car. And then Archie uh, sets him up for a uh, imagine if test. Uh, imagine if you had this functionality so that they can get a reaction from him. Uh, um, uh, so they can see if he if he wants this thing. They talk to him about financing for a while and whether that is or isn't painful and if if understanding the payment is what's important and they want they want to make sure he actually has the problem they're solving because if he doesn't well then they know he's not gonna like it. Uh, and then they have him imagine what the solution looks like. Okay. Okay I'm gonna take control just one second just to go through this role-playing exercise uh, real quick Matt. Uh, so uh, let's say that you went on our site, and this is a, an example of what an online application might look like, the different types of things that we would ask. And um, let's say you went online, you, you filled this out, and then you have an apply button. And after you hit an apply button, you get an immediate response. Uh, so I wanted to show you what that response would be and then get your reaction to that, all right? Okay. So let's say you fill out the application, you hit apply, and this page comes up. Can you give me your reaction to this? Mm, you're pushing me into a car. Mm. That's my initial reaction. Okay. Um, you know what? It depends on a guess. Does it sound like he liked that idea? No. Uh, so I don't know if you, uh, I might, would ask you, did, did they look surprised by what he did? Maybe a little, maybe not. Look, uh, they've been doing this all morning. Um, and it, what, what's interesting is when they start putting the solution on the back of real data, on the back of the cars that these people are interested in, they start not getting uh, the reaction they'd expected. Uh, they started getting reactions like, hey, you're pushing me to decide right now. Or uh, when people start looking closely at those finance rates, they start to say that those rates look high and their bank has lower rates. Uh, and they start to uh, say, uh, they start to get confused because some cars have different rates. Uh, older cars with more mileage have higher rates and sometimes it's so different that more expensive cars have lower payments. And uh, people are getting really confused and frustrated by all this. Uh, and this is a problem. Uh, at the end of this, they're, they're realizing that trying to decide what car you want is hard enough. Layering on financing on top of that is making it even harder. And this is not working out. This is why these people have such crap expressions on their face, faces. The, the, the hypothesis isn't that if we provide, if we show people decisions on all cars, meaning the, the payment amount on all cars, that they will get confused and frustrated, they will doubt the quality of our brand, and they will go to their banks to shop for better financing. Uh, that's not the hypothesis. Uh, and, uh, well, the net result for the organization is they're going to make a lot more money, hundreds of millions of dollars more money, and these people are not so happy about it. Now, if you work for a company like this, you know how this goes. The, the executive whose idea it is is going to tell them to keep testing until he gets the answer, they get the answer that he wants. Uh, and uh, they're a publicly traded company, so I had to get permission to show the videos. And uh, they're super nice, and they're great about it. And those, uh, the video I took is over a year and a half old, and they are still trying to figure that out. What they are not doing is building production software. Because at least by testing this, they're realizing that if we built this thing the way it's panning out or the way it's looking, it's going to hurt us. Uh, it's not going to work out. Uh, they understand that. Now, 
let me uh, show a couple more examples of what an MVP is, and let's see if I can pull this together. Look, the can people use it, or by the way, is, look, what you just saw or what I just went through is called a value test. A value test doesn't check to see if people can figure out how to use your product. You show them the product, and you want to see their reaction. Um, the, the, a lot of people show, ask me, what, what kind of questions do you ask people to see if they like your product? That's a stupid question. It's like, what kind of questions do you ask your spouse to see if they're mad at you? If you have to ask, they're mad at you. If you have to ask if someone likes your product, they don't. Uh, that's the way this works. Uh, it, it becomes uh, fairly obvious. Now, but that's a different thing than can people use it. Can people use it? That's, uh, you do that by letting people use it. These people are testing a product for usability. Has anybody ever done a paper prototype kind of test like this before? So just a, yeah, look, more than I thought. Uh, look, uh, the guy in the back is a computer. You can tell that that's his memory in front of him. Uh, she's a user. She's using a nice drag and drop UI where she's mapping one thing to another thing. Uh, come on, just map it. I'm running out of time, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you see the mapping magically appears on the screen. Uh, and th this, is, uh, this is how this works. Now, this may look like simplistic software, but these people work for HP. They make a product called StorageWorks. The software they use manages rooms full of disk arrays in data centers. They don't need to know if this functionality is a good idea. They already have it. And what they know is it is super hard to use, and it sucks a lot. They need something more usable, but it's sophisticated enough that for them to build a working prototype out of software is going to take hours or days, but they can iterate through lots of different ideas in an afternoon doing this and really narrow the field. If your biggest concern is can people use it, uh, that's the fastest way to learn. Now, th there's the can we actually build it stuff. And most people working in agile environments where the only thing you're responsible for is just building stuff know the answer to how do we test if we can actually build it, and that's this spike thing. As, uh, I don't have pictures to show what a spike looks like, but uh, people know that you use that to explore technology, to build a reference architecture, explore some legacy code, try a couple different uh, application frameworks, uh, try multiple solutions. Uh, that's a, a way to test an idea. Now, this is my last uh, thing here, that this last hardest problem is the will they keep using it problem. And no amount of paper prototyping, no amount of cobbled together prototypes will help you here. Um, well, do I want to show this this way? Look, there's a visualization that comes from this guy named Henrik Nieberg. And people might have seen this, where if you have a hypothesis for a product solution and you believe lots of people will use it and love it and you'll make a lot of money, his suggestion was that you start by shipping something crappy, uh, like, like that for a transportation solution. If you ship that to customers, they say, this sort of sucks. Uh, it's worse than walking. I fall down on that, and I didn't fall down walking. You can say, well, we've iterated, and uh, now we've fixed the falling down problem. And you can say, well, yeah, but I've got a lot farther to go. And you can say, well, we fixed the distance problem. And if your target market is the Netherlands or Portland, Oregon, that's viable. If it's Southern California, not so much. Uh, you can iterate beyond that. But what you start to find is viable somewhere in between there. So what Henrik is suggesting is you ship crappy stuff to people until uh, you figure out what they like which sounds not so good. That sounds like it might hurt your company. Now, Henrik uh, did a lot of work for this company called Spotify. And somebody, some folks might have heard of these Spotify development culture videos. Does anybody work for a company that is now having to call their team a squad? Who has to call their team a squad? It's because of this guy, uh, <laughs> as that mother. Anyway. Uh, Here's a short segment uh, from one of those Spotify development culture videos. And this is the guy that you know, just did this visualization. But I want you to see how this actually works. Now, he uses the term MVP to talk about this thing that you ship. Uh, but you need to listen to what it is and who it goes to. Our product development approach is based on lean startup principles. And is summarized by the mantra, think it, build it, ship it, tweak it. The biggest risk is always building the wrong thing. 
So before deciding to build a new product or major feature, we try to inform ourselves with research. Do people actually want this? Does it solve a real problem for them? Then we define a narrative, kind of like a press release or elevator pitch, showing off the benefits. For example, radio you can save or follow your favorite artist. We also define hypotheses. How will this feature impact user behavior and our core metrics? Will they share more music? Will they log in more often? And we build various prototypes and have people try them out to get a sense of what the feature might feel like and how people react. Once we feel confident this thing is worth building, we go ahead and build an MVP, minimum viable product. Just enough to fulfill the narrative, but far from feature complete. You might call it the minimum lovable product. The next stage of learning happens once we put something into production. So we want to get there as quickly as possible. We release the MVP to just a few percent of all users and use techniques like A-B testing to measure the impact and test our hypotheses. The squad monitors the data and continues tweaking and redeploying until they see the desired impact. Then they gradually roll out to the rest of the world while taking the time needed to sort out practical stuff like operational issues and scaling. By the time the product or feature is fully rolled out, we already know it's a success because if it isn't, we don't roll it out. Impact is always more important than velocity, so a feature isn't really considered done until it has achieved the desired impact. Nope. I'm gonna stop it there. Uh, the day I was at Spotify, somebody had defiled that sign on the wall. Um, it, it, the important thing to pay attention to here is what they are shipping isn't scalable, shippable software. What they are shipping is software that, well, it works, but it's, uh, well, it's right around in here. Uh, it, it works, uh, but you heard him say it is far from feature complete. Uh, and uh, they only ship it to a, a few percentage of users, and they can choose where that goes to geographically, uh, really in a very fine-grained way. And the difference between shipping well, a few percentage of users in Spotify might be tens of, or, uh, tens of thousands of users, but the difference between that and all their market are millions of users and localized to a number of different languages, and the cost to build up the software from here to there is huge. Uh, they understand what it means to build to learn, and they know it's different. And again, and there's Dave, uh, when we talk about continuous delivery, Spotify leverages, continu leverages continuous delivery, but the one thing they are not stupid enough to do is ship changes to everybody. That would be expensive and stupid, and don't. Uh, and, and that's what continuous delivery is used for. It's used for testing. It's used to make sure that we're right because ultimately if we make our company look bad, if we don't make money, we, we go out of business. Now, we, uh, I hear lots of talks about continuous delivery, but nobody talks about how much of those deliveries are tests. Uh, I, I hear lots of... Uh, uh, this is the, the way that we work. We are deliberate about building to learn. Now, I've got a couple more examples, but I want to leave room for questions, and I think I'm at time anyway because it's about an hour. Uh, look, don't confuse the stuff your company builds to earn money and make a living with the stuff that you build to learn. D don't waste money building scalable, shippable software to learn. And well, the, the phrase I forgot to use earlier on is, and the phrase that comes from product people that do this well, is to nail it b before you scale it. And I'm going to end there. Thanks very much for listening to us. Thank you.